And even after we've been hit by a major event, we assume that all of this will work again. But Munich Re has said, well, we're going to have to figure out how to change our risk models. This is a major challenge for us as a reinsurance industry. It is a major challenge for engineers that have to figure out how to change their design criteria, and therefore a major challenge for governments to figure out how they're going to change the rules. We're all scrambling to figure out how to do that. So what are we facing? Well, the recent IPCC report has documented a number of potential changes in climate. This is from the North America chapter, uh, Working Group 2, and it shows changes in temperature and precipitation projected for North America. The red means warming of at least three, three and a half degrees, possibly more. Down here for precipitation, the green means increased precipitation and this light to uh, brownish color means decrease. The thing to notice here is that in general we're talking about warmer and wetter winters to come, but the summer the area of reduced precipitation creeps up in the southern Canada, so very likely our future summer is going to be warmer and drier. Warmer and wetter winters, warmer and drier summers. Over the lifetime of infrastructure that is built today, anything built now is going to have to survive and function and operate over the course of this scenario. So this too comes from the North America chapter uh, of the recent IPCC report. And it lays out an example of what kind of a temperature change each of these major pieces of infrastructure, like roads, water treatment plants, bridges, are going to live through. The yellow refers to this middle climate change scenario called A1B. So your dam that is built now is going to experience a warming somewhere between 3 and 5 degrees during its lifetime. Our dams today being designed to include that in an explicit way? That's an important question. Essentially, from a technical aspect, we're not talking about behavior yet, but from a technical aspect, climate change is going to be about changes in statistics. Changes in risk being, meaning changes in likelihood, changes in probability, changes in magnitude. But they're going to look different for temperature and for precipitation. A change in a temperature risk is liable to mean, if you assume that temperatures are normally distributed between average, cold, and hot, that the number of times such temperatures occur are just going to shift over, so the probability of having cold weather reduces and the probability of having hot weather increases. Maybe you can figure out what that is. Precipitation distributions are quite different. They don't look like that at all. If you look at the probability of occurrence of very light precipitation, that's right, very high and very heavy precipitation is very low. And whatever average precipitation is, is somewhere in the middle, but it doesn't look like this at all. In a climate change, at least what climate scientists are telling us, is that it is most likely that we will see fewer of these light precipitation events. So this part of the curve is going to drop, and we will see more of these heavy precipitation events, so that part of the curve is going to increase. And this is going to be region specific. It's going to be quite different here in Vancouver compared to Calgary, Winnipeg, Toronto, and so on. And being able to figure out what this is going to look like is going to be quite a challenge. Again, if there were climate modelers here, they would talk about the problems of downscaling, of capturing rainfall in regional climate models and so on. So this is not going to be easy to figure this out. But there is a consensus statement developing that, in general, this is where we're headed. Now, that's just temperature and rainfall. That's not a damage report. It's quite likely that we could see very significant changes in damages if we see more of these events in the tail occurring more often. Because infrastructure is going to be sensitive to a lot of things. The rate of climate change, the mean climate change, the extremes, but also our ability to maintain them, to change designs, and maybe to change a number of other things about decisions. All of that being part of what has been referred to as adaptive capacity. And all of this is going to involve questions of balance between safety, reliability, and cost, which managers, planners, and governments make all the time. How does climate change affect the ability of planners, managements, and government to balance objectives? 
That's one of the first things that people in those positions have told me when I've done research on this issue. They don't know how climate change is going to affect this juggling act, but they're pretty darn sure that it will. And so being able to bring climate change explicitly into this is the reason why we need a dialogue that's going to have to be a lot more creative than the dialogues that we've had 20, 30 years ago. There's a recent article by Millie et al., which has made a very stark point about climate statistics. Stationarity is dead, he said. Climate change undermines the basic assumption that natural systems fluctuate within an unchanging envelope of variability. Well, climate science is telling us that all manners of climate statistics are about to change. We're going to have to figure out how to deal with this. Increasing extremes will result in changes in effective return periods for statistical events. Karen and Zwier said we might see such return periods reduced by a factor of two. Other adaptation needs. Alden MacGyver have talked about updating climate design values, changing building codes and infrastructure standards, better disaster management planning, improved weather warning programs. Monitoring constantly comes up. Monitoring is very non-sexy. It's very hard to keep these things going because it costs a lot of money to maintain a lot of stations over long periods of time. And we see station closures and we see unequal station coverage. So how do we sustain and improve existing on-the-ground climate monitor, monitor? Changes in land use planning may have to be part of this. More rigorous maintenance of codes that are already on the books. There have been stories that have emerged from a number of the hurricane regions in the U.S. that said that these damages would not have been so severe if the original building codes on the books were maintained and enforced. <coughs> it's a local governance problem. Materials, insurance issues, relocation of structures, replacement of unreliable structures. A lot of stuff that has to be part of this conversation. Coming at it from an impacts and adaptation perspective, which is where I am, because this is the research that I do. The world we live in is clearly not a linear or formulaic kind of process. Defining the problem is a challenge because it really does require a new conversation between researchers and actors, or we call them stakeholders. We have to deal with the scaling issues. Beyond the scaling issues that climate scientists are facing, when we write the damage report, we have to find ways to combine global climate change scenarios and local scenarios of population and development. We have to figure out how to choose the tools. If we want to get a damage report that involves agriculture, hydrology, forestry, and so on, we have to deal with all this and the handshake between climate science and all of these other fields which have created these tools. We then have to move from here to something that gets closer to the policy arena. The decision support models in economics and engineering. What is the role of expert judgment? What is the role of local knowledge holders and practitioners in this process? And how do you get that kind of information in, in a reasonable way that people will understand? Which means context and dialogue is not only important in here, but in also communicating this to those that are in the decision-making world. And yes, there are scale issues that influence people's thoughts where they come into this conversation. This I and Hume had come up with a rather interesting uh, way of, of, of uh, portraying this, where they talked about how a lot of the global climate change information was coming down from this global perspective. The climate models, the emissions models, the global development models all came from here, future-focused, global in scale, whereas the information about vulnerabilities, sensitivities, were coming from the past and present and local in scale. And somehow, we had to get these communities to talk to each other in the middle. Yeah, not easy. Think of an institution, university, government, that sustains this kind of dialogue over the long term. It's hard to identify them. Maybe there are a couple. A lot of this work is being developed by individuals who have been devoting their personal careers to this and trying to build programs to link these scales together. And the IPCC is now recognizing this. And in the third assessment report and the fourth assessment report have devoted more pages to climate change adaptation than they had when they started 20 years ago. So there's an encouraging sign that more of this is beginning to occur. But you can see where we're coming from. We have a lot of language issues to deal with between the various disciplines. 